Okay, welcome everybody. And um, for those of you who haven't met me yet, I'm Louise Johnson. I'm an evolutionary biologist and geneticist, and, and you'll meet me in a chunk of the first year modules. Uh, most of you will be taking the evolution module in the first year, which is, is, is one of my modules. And I'll also turn up in the building blocks of life, um, sort of need to know all about everything biology module. Um, this is a lecture that um, sort of sometimes drops in as part of the building blocks of life. And it's a slightly unusual lecture because it's about history rather than directly about the science. It's about how uh, the ideas have developed over time. And I think it's, uh, it's useful to learn a bit about the history of the ideas, uh, partly because it's interesting in its own right, partly because for some people it really helps to have a kind of framework to hang ideas on, um, and partly because uh, it helps you understand how sometimes those difficult these ideas are, how counterintuitive some of the ideas you're, you're learning are. If you're doing genetics, you're doing a subject that is really quite young. Um, genetics as we know it is, is barely 100 years old. But it builds on um, a lot of thought and curiosity right back to ancient times. People have always wondered, how does a duck egg know to hatch into a duck? How does a chicken egg differ from a duck egg? Um, why do children resemble their parents? And there were some really powerful wrong ideas that uh, have been sort of overthrown by developments in genetics. And I'm going to really focus this talk on three wrong ideas and how they were proven wrong and uh, what we now know. So first wrong idea um, is symbolized by this paint here. And that's the idea that heredity, that genetics is about blending. That if you are a tall person and you have a child with a short person, then you'll have a middle-sized child. And the idea was always that this was like mixing paint together, or blending bloods was how it was described. And the thing about blending is once you've mixed your uh, blue and yellow paints together, you've got green paint, you can never get the blue and the yellow back out again. Blending removes variation, it removes diversity. Another wrong idea was something called the idea that there were fixed essences, that there was just something, something almost magical, something ducky about a duck egg, that it knew it was a duck egg and should hatch into a duck, and there was something chickeny about a chicken egg, some kind of, of mysterious force that kept species the same, that species had a kind of magical essence. And the third wrong idea, uh, which was propounded by Aristotle, uh, the first scientist, there are amazing books about him, um, was that your environment very directly influenced you and your offspring as well. One example of this would be that Aristotle thought that blacksmiths, who spent all day lifting heavy hammers, would have really strong arms. And not only would they have strong arms, but their children would have strong arms. The life they led would affect not just themselves, but their children. Another uh, interesting example of how your environment was supposed to directly affect you was, I'm just looking to see if there are any small children in the audience. There aren't. Good. <laughs> Aristotle believed that the act that generated uh, a child, that the, um, the, the copulation that resulted in a baby had huge, huge influence on that baby's entire future life. He thought that if it was exciting and urgent and hot and just generally really quite good, then you would get a strong, vigorous offspring. And if it was not so good, you would get a girl. <laughs> so these were the kind of ideas people had about heredity, you know, back you know, thousands of years ago that 
heredity was blending, blending away differences, that there was some magical force that kept species the same, and that there were direct effects of the environment on heredity. And these wrong ideas persisted for ages and ages and ages, and it really was only in about the Victorian times that breakthroughs started to be made in uh, taking these bad ideas down and allowing the new subject of genetics to arise in its place. And this is probably the most famous of them. Uh, this is Gregor Mendel. Someone tell me a fact about Gregor Mendel. Sorry? Uh, he was Austrian, but actually he wasn't a monk. He was a friar. Now, uh, we all have to do a new lecturer's course at Reading, and I did my new lecturer's course at the same time as an ecclesiastical historian who was complaining to me that her students didn't know anything. She said, you wouldn't believe, you would not believe that they come into my classroom and they don't know the difference between a monk and a friar. <laughs> and I said, gosh, terrible. <laughs> Imagine not knowing the difference. So I went and looked up the difference between a monk and a friar. And it turns out that it's actually surprisingly relevant. Monks uh, are, take an extra vow that says they have to seclude themselves from the world. Friars are meant to go out into the world and change it. So by being a friar instead of a monk, Mendel had to, as part of his duty, he had to go out and be part of the intellectual world. He presented papers, he wrote, he debated, uh, he was a mathematician, a statistician, a meteorologist. Uh, he knew what he was doing. He was a real part of the intellectual community of his time. Uh, he wasn't just messing about in a, in a back garden trying to you know, grow some peas. He was really interested in the subject of heredity. He originally was going to do experiments with mice, um, but uh, he was not allowed to do that on Abbey um, places because that would involve all the mice having sex, which was bad. So he was allowed instead to work on peas. And he blew away with one uh, careful experiment, one of those wrong ideas, and nobody paid any attention for 50 years. He showed that you could cross uh, peas together with yellow and green seeds. And while it looked at first as if those differences were blending away or being masked, you could get them back out again afterwards. Whatever was happening inside these pea plants, differences and diversity were being kept from one generation to the next. They were not being blended away. And he wrote this up. He published it in a very reputable journal. And yet it was ignored for a generation. And there's still debate as to why nobody paid attention to these amazing results of Mendel's. And the, the theory that I favor is that people did not understand that this wasn't just an experiment about peas. Remember, people still thought in terms of fixed differences between species. They thought that something you found out in peas would tell you about peas, but it wouldn't tell you about mice. It wouldn't tell you about people. And so before the results of Gregor's experiment could be appreciated for the breakthrough they were, other wrong ideas had to weaken as well. So Mendel made a start at demolishing the idea of blending inheritance. But that made a bit of a false start, and it was only later that it was understood. This is another early experimenter, uh, and this is a terribly severe Victorian chap by the name of August Weissmann, uh, who took aim at the idea of the inheritance of acquired characteristics, this idea that the environment directly gets you and changes how you pass on your uh, inheritance. Weissmann uh, decided to test the predominant theory of inheritance that it was around at his time, which was the theory that Darwin believed. 
which was called the theory of gemules. This was the idea that all the parts of your body give off little particles all the time. So your hands are giving off hand gemules and your brain is giving out brain gemules and they all go into your bloodstream. And the idea was that they thought your gonads were like a little sieve that would collect all the gemules from your bloodstream, package them up and put them into your offspring. So Weissman didn't think much of this theory, but uh, he did devise uh, an experiment which he, he reasoned thusly. If you have a mouse and the mouse's tail is making all the tail gemules, then if you cut that tail off, no more tail gemules, no more tails, and the offspring will be born tailless. So he got some mice and he got a large knife and he <laughs> you know, uh, cut the tails off the mice and bred them. And they still had tails, and he wondered if maybe this was some leftover gemules circulating in their bloodstream. He cut the tails off mice for six or seven generations. He was thorough in his, uh, in his experiments. And the mice kept having tails. So he established that there was something that the mice's gonads were doing that was not just collecting information from the body, that they had that information already. Something was... Uh, present in the mouse gonads that was not affected by their body. And he introduced the terms of germline, the part of you that would go on to make offspring, and the soma, the, the disposable part that is your body. So two of those ideas are now weakened. What about this third idea, the, the, the fixed essence of a species? This was starting to be challenged, again, in, in Victorian, late Victorian times, by um, new observations and by new technology. The microscope had gone from being something that only a very few people could afford to a mass-produced um, and quite a popular hobby. If you were a, a Victorian with pretensions to uh, intellectuality, you might buy yourself a microscope uh, and you might look at things under the microscope. Um, there was a book called Sketches Through the Microscope by Mary Ward, which was a, a bestseller in late Victorian times until Mary herself was killed in the first ever automobile accident. And people who looked at living things under microscopes started to accumulate a body of kind of interesting knowledge about their cells. And the vital thing was that all cells from all living things, at some point, showed things like this. These string-like stained objects. Um, they called them chromosomes. Chromo for colour, some for thing. So chromosome just means like coloured thing. Um, the, the sort of mystery of the new science is sort of crystallised in that word. No one knew what they were, no one knew what they did, but they were present in cells. And it turns out that each species had a particular static number of these cells. If you looked at a, a muntjac deer's cells, it would always have four chromosomes. If you looked at a human cell, it would have 46 chromosomes. And in some really nice experiments using sea urchins, it was shown that if you missed a chromosome, or if you had the wrong number of a chromosome, or too many chromosomes, everything started to go wrong with development. Chromosomes, it looked like, were needed to make a cell work properly, to make an animal develop properly. And so the chromosome theory, which is the idea that chromosomes had something to do with inheritance, began to be propounded at the end of the 19th century. There was still no clue what was in chromosomes, what they were, what they were made of, or even less, still less how they worked. But people were starting to get the idea that chromosomes were part of the answer, were this key to the thousands of years old puzzle of heredity. Enter my scientific hero, 
It's the one I've named my cat after, uh, Thomas Hunt Morgan. Morgan uh, was going to, uh, was consciously inspired by Mendel, but decided that pea plants were too big and too cumbersome to work with. And so he decided to work on this tiny, tiny little fly, Drosophila melanogaster. Morgan uh, is particularly admirable because it wasn't just that he was an amazing scientist himself. He trained lots of amazing scientists in his lab. Nettie Stevens, who was the discoverer of sex chromosomes, the first time a particular trait had been tied down to a particular chromosome was Nettie Stevens' work. She worked in Morgan's lab. Alfred Sturtevant, um, who also worked in Morgan's lab and eventually shared the Nobel Prize with him, uh, entered Morgan's lab to help him clean up the bottles in which the flies lived. And at the age of 19, drew the first genetic map. Morgan was able, by really, really careful experiments just involving crossing and counting flies, to show that the chromosomes had information on them and that it was in a linear sequence, that it was in an order. Somewhere on that string-like structure, there were things that made the organism different. One of his breakthroughs was to find this gene for white eyes. Normally, Drosophila eyes are red. Um, the white-eyed fly, which he found as just a sporadic mutant, uh, crossed it with all kinds of other flies with twisty wings and sizzly looking bristles and, and other weird characteristics. And he was able to show that you could put these genes, which by then were called genes, in an order and ascribe them to a chromosome. This chromosome has the gene for eye color on it. This gene for wing shape is on this other chromosome here. And I do think it's amazing that before anyone knew what chromosomes were made of or how any of this worked, they were able to produce these detailed maps of which genes were where. So Morgan uh, narrowed down the search for heredity to the chromosomes. The chromosomes had been analyzed biochemically. They were made of about 50-50 protein and something called DNA. The DNA was thought to be this boring stuff, maybe just string that tied the proteins together. Proteins, it was known, were biologically interesting molecules. And so the prevailing idea was that proteins must be the important bit, DNA less so. But we've already come an awful long way from that strange mishmash of ideas about blending bloods. So Morgan was working in a sort of 1910 to 1920. A little bit later on, a really, really cool, again, new technology came along that allowed uh, genetics to change beyond recognition. And this was the idea that you could make mutants. Morgan, at first, had to work with mutants that he just found randomly. But H.J. Uh, Muller showed that you could x-ray flies and mutate them. If you x-rayed a fly and then crossed it, you would get, in its offspring, a whole new range of variants that you could then uh, examine. This changed genetics because now you could have as many mutants as you wanted. You could use genetics to understand other processes. People weren't just interested in genetics because that's how heredity worked. But if you were interested in eye development, you could zap a bunch of flies with x-rays, find offspring that didn't have eyes, and then use them to understand the process of how eyes happened. Um, if you were interested in memory, you could devise an experiment that tested a fly's memory. You could zap the flies with x-rays. You could find flies with no memory. And you could use those to tease apart what was happening when a memory developed or when a fly was able to make a memory. So Muller's discovery of x-ray mutagenesis changed genetics. And there's another less publicized discovery, um, which was also very important. 
this is Charlotte Auerbach, who mostly worked at the University of Edinburgh. She discovered the first mutagen that was a chemical. Uh, this is the diagram of the structure of that chemical. Uh, it's mustard gas. Auerbach was investigating the phenomenon where soldiers who had been gassed in the First World War um, came back and there was a high rate of birth defects in their children. She was able to show that the mustard gas molecule reacted really badly with the chromosomes. But interestingly, it didn't react with the proteins on the chromosomes. This molecule and proteins don't really do much together, but this molecule attacks DNA. So her discovery started to suggest that maybe DNA wasn't as boring as everyone had always assumed it was. Maybe something uh, cool and interesting was happening there. <laughs> Round about the same time, this is to be talking now the 1930s, 1940s, people were making connections between genetics, as the science was now known, and biochemistry. Uh, this moustache chap is George Beadle. I don't know who uh, the lady is. Um, I hope it's a woman called Maria Mitchell, who's a hero of mine, but I can't find a picture of her. Uh, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, come and ask me later about Maria Mitchell. I will uh, talk at length, I promise. Um, Beadle thought that fruit flies were too large and too cumbersome to work on, and so he found an even smaller, uh, faster-growing organism, which is the bread mold, Neurospora crassa. Basically the same stuff that, that grows on your loaf if you, if you forget about it. Under the microscope, it's actually quite cute. Um, this is a, a genetically engineered bread mold that uh, lights up green. Um, but it grows in these um, long um, strings of spores. Beadle and his um, collaborators found that the genes that they were looking at seemed to correspond to steps in a biochemical pathway. The fungus would turn this sugar into that sugar, into that protein, into that whatever. Uh, and each step in that process seemed to correspond to one of the genes that they found, one of the mutations um, that you could categorize. And so Beadle and his collaborators suggested that what genes were, what the information was that was on the chromosomes was instructions for making proteins, instructions for making enzymes that changed the um, components of the biochemical pathway. So this was the first um, coherent idea that was put forward of what genes were, much, much later than finding out where they were on the chromosome or how you could track them across generations. So we now have a sort of full attack on those three wrong ideas there, undermined almost completely. And the very sort of famous date in genetics is 1953, when Watson and Crick, with the help of Rosalind Franklin, um, worked out the structure of DNA. And many people might take the working out of the structure of DNA is the beginning of genetics. Um, but in this talk, I've made it the end, the culmination, because um, the structure of DNA is kind of what is different between a duck egg and a chicken egg. They've got different DNA. The structure of DNA is why organisms don't blend with each other. They keep the DNA separate. And the structure of DNA um, is also why the environment doesn't directly change your genes, because your DNA is kept away from the environment in your, in your gonads. So out of this kind of cloud of misunderstandings about gemmules and blending inheritance and acquired characteristics and fixed essences of, of, of different species, in the um, Victorian era came uh, Mendel's laws of genetics, 
They merged with cell biology to help us understand chromosome theory. Later on, statistics got involved and evolutionary and population genetics was born. And in the 1950s, this fused with biochemistry and biophysics to get a really molecular understanding of how genes worked, why offspring resemble their parents. And these thousands of years of mystery over a really short time span sort of crystallized into this beautiful, precise science. And pretty much whatever science you do as a biologist of any kind, you will use genetics at some point. Um, if you're a forensic scientist, then you use genetic fingerprinting. If you're a zoologist, you use DNA sequences to make a phylogeny of the species you're interested in. If you're a, a pharmacist, then you'll be interested in personal genome sequencing and tailoring drug regimes to people's particular genetic uh, makeup. So this set of techniques is going to be hugely, hugely important to you, whatever kind of biologist you are. And who knows what is going to happen in the future? I'm actually slightly envious of people who are starting out in biology today because you are going to learn amazing things that I might not be around to find out. So I hope you have an amazing time of it. And uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you.